All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our presentation today is from our star VA intern, Ashley Bernheisel, who's been navigating mountains of paperwork and doing a great job. So we'll let her get started. All right, today's case is about an 80-year-old man who walked in to my clinic from the VAED. His com main complaint was that he had a sudden decrease in his vision in his left eye. He described that his vision loss started two days prior to presentation, and at first, the first day it was just blurry, and then the next day it was as, as if a complete current had come over his left eye, and then he didn't make it in until the next day, as most, as most vet stories go. Um, he denied any associated flashes of light, <coughs> floaters, no headache, no eye pain. His past medical history uh, is congestive heart failure, hypertension, sleep apnea, some dermatitis, AFib, some severe left uh, lower extremity neuropathy in which he needs a, c a cane for, COPD, and hyperlipidemia. Uh, here's his long list of medications, <coughs> again, as most of our vets have. His prior ocular history is pretty minimal. He did have both cataracts done in July of 2013, about two weeks apart. He was last seen in an ophthalmology clinic in August of 2013. Um, at that time, he was given artificial tears for mild blepharitis, um, and his vision at that time, about a month after cataract surgery, was 20-25 in the right eye and 20-30 in the left. Um, he was discharged to optometry after that point. In October 2014, so just uh, a few months before I saw him, he was seen by optom and was, had 20-20 vision in both eyes. So on his eye exam, his visual acuity when I saw him, he was 2015 in the right eye with correction um, and no light perception in the left. His pupils had a four plus APD in the left eye. I tried to measure it with um, the log filters and there were not enough of them to make any difference in his APD. Uh, his sclera were normal, cornea normal, anterior chamber was, was clear and quiet and his, ir his irises were normal in both eyes. On fundoscopic exam, his vitreous showed no anterior vitreous cell in either eye. His optic nerve, uh, his right eye did show a small splinter hemorrhage inferiorly. His left eye, uh, the optic nerve was diffusely pale. There was some mild edema and some thickening inferiorly um, with some bright white exudate. The cup to disc ratio was 0.5 on the right and 0.3 on the left. His macula showed some mild AMD in both eyes and there was no red cherry red spot in either eye. His periphery in the right eye was normal, and in the left eye there were some attenuated vessels. So here is his fundoscopic exam photos. You can see in the right, you can still see the, the borders clearly of the optic disc, and there's just that minor splinter hemorrhage inferiorly that you actually had to look a few times to really even be able to notice. Um, in the left eye, you can see that those borders of the optic nerve are, are more difficult to define. And although, and, and, the, and the, the, it is very pale, not quite chalky white, um, but there is a, a little bit of a um, cotton white spot inferiorly. Now the, the pictures kind of make it look like there is a cherry red spot, but I think it's just the way that these are um, developed. So the differential at this point, um, biggest on my differential at first was NAION, also AAION. Um, and really, there's a, a large differential. It could be an infiltrate, toxic metabolic demyelinating. So locking in the diagnosis in this patient, I'd ask a few more questions. So um, continue to deny any kind of headaches, no jaw, glottic jaw claudication, no girdle weakness. Um, he did feel like he had some, lost some weight. When I initially asked him, he said, oh, yeah, I've lost some weight. It's been really slow over the last couple of years. I think it's just because I'm getting old. When asked again later, he said, oh, yeah, I, I guess my appetite's been pretty poor lately. And then comparing his VA picture that's in the system compared to how he looked um, at that moment, there was quite a bit of thinning temporally. So when evaluating his temporal arteries, um, right uh, anterior to his ears, he actually had pulses 
bilaterally. But it wasn't until you, he, I felt um, up more in the ocular region that you actually lost the pulsation in the left uh, temporal artery. Um, but there was no tenderness. So based on the severity of his vision loss, the optic nerve appearance, his weight loss, and then the loss of the pulse um, in the left uh, temporal artery, is we, we decided that this was definitely GCA. So that's what we used to decide he had GCA. However, there is no really clear classification criteria. What is available is largely based off of a 1990 study published by the American College of Rheumatology. So this, this study, the, the main point of the study was to really compare uh, GCA to other vasculitides. And it was from that study that they came up with a sensitivity and specificity of 93 and 91% if uh, the patients have three of five criteria. Um, however, it's kind of been adopted as just diagnostic criteria for uh, temporal arteritis in general, as even though that was never the intended purpose of the study. Um, so here's that table, I call it a differentiation table because it really wasn't meant to be a classification table. So if patients ha are either have an age over 50, um, a new headache or a new type of headache or head pain, um, ESR greater than 50, um, tep temporal artery tenderness or um, a loss of pulsation or a biopsy specimen, then um, those are the sensitivity and specificities if they have three or more. So just a little bit about temporal arteritis, um, or GCA is now a more common term. It is the most common vasculitis affecting people over the age 50. Uh, it's most common in Caucasian females. The female to male ratio is about 2.5 to 1. And visual symptoms occur in about 30% of patients. And a lot of studies have a large variety as far as what that's quoted, but 30 appears to be about the average, and about half of those end up being permanent vision loss. So uh, it tends to occur in medium to large size vessels of the head and neck, and prevalence studies, again, are varied, about one, 100 to 300 per 100,000 patients, and incidence is about 3 to 22 per 100,000, and the median age is about 70 years. So as ophthalmologists, an important question is whether or not we can predict which patients will end up with permanent vision loss. So uh, the answer is that if their vision is still transient, if they if they're have double vision, if they're having a curtain come over their eye and then go away, if they're kind of in that um, waxing and waning stages, if you start them on a corticosteroid in that, in that time period, um, then you're more likely to preserve their vision. However, once they have a defect, it's pretty much going to be permanent. So what causes uh, this, this disease is really poorly understood. We do know that it is an autoimmune disease. Um, some various studies have shown that there's seasonal and geographic variation, um, which makes it seem more like um, an autoimmune disease because it looks like infections such as mycoplasma, chlamydia pneumonia, parvovirus 19, might bring on um, sort of that autoimmune inflammatory response. <coughs> there also appears to, there are some studies that show there might be some genetic predisposition, predisposition with certain HLA types, and also um, some gene polymorphisms in IL-6 and TNF, as well as other um, immune system um, polymorphisms. So some extraocular manifestations. Um, Aortic aneurysms and aortic dissections, those usually happen um, not acutely, but down, down the line. Um, polymyalgia rheumatica is associated about 50% of the, 30 to 50% of the time with this disease, either before, with, or after the diagnosis. Um, scalp necrosis, as you can see in the patient, is a manifestation of this disease, although it's pretty rare. Yeah. You can also get stroke um, and MI. Um, and the, vas the vasculitis can cover the entire or aorta and even go down into the iliac arteries. So about going back to our patient, he was admitted directly from my clinic to the neurology s service. He was given three days of IV steroids. Um, and due to the patient's request, because he only wanted to stay two nights in the hospital, he received three doses of 1,000 milligrams of IV, IV solumedrol. 
current recommendations are 250 milligrams IV Q6 hours for three days. On admission, his ESR was 16, CRP 19.5, and platelets 233. So again, those aren't, those aren't super high, but based on our clinical suspicion, uh, he underwent a, a temporal artery biopsy, and that biopsy was positive. So talking a little bit about pathology for this disease, uh, it's a transmural inflammation of all three layers. Uh, there can be obliteration of the lumen, um, and ca which causes the ischemic complications, which I just spoke about. Infiltrates can include T cells, macrophages, um, and biopsies can show skip lesions. Um, giant cells for which it gets its name aren't always present and are not necessary to make the diagnosis. So here's a normal um, temporal artery biopsy. You can see the, the, the layers here, the adventitia on the outside. Um, looks like he must got moved around. The arrows scared a little. Oh, they're just really light. So the media um, in the middle and the intima in between. And you can kind of see the, the wavy lines um, right here that go back and forth. And that's really, that's important to note on these because that's the internal elastic lamina, which GCA characteristically uh, destroys. So, yes, yeah. So, the adventitia is right here, this darker layer. The contrast isn't really good. I don't know if you can see kind of where it ends. Um, but you can kind of see right here, this is kind of a thicker layer right here, and that's the media. And then the, the swiggly lines right here, that's the elastic la um, lamina, and then the intima is the inner layer. Is that, does that sound, does that okay? So this is from this patient. Um, a friend who's a PATH resident was able to take pictures for me, which I really appreciate. Um, so there's the c characteristic of GCA, like I said before, is that there's infiltrate in all three layers. And actually, I think in this picture, you can kind of see the three layers even better. Um, they all have those blue or pur purple spots, so showing that there's inflammation in all three layers. And you can see that there's obliteration of the lumen here. And if you go, actually, if I go back, you can kind of see where this, the back and forth squiggly lines end because of the infiltrate. And that's kind of the line showing where, where um, there's more inflammation, so you see more of the blue and the purple in that area. And that's also where that elastic lamina is not present anymore. And this is a little closer up. Again, in the top, um, the top left corner, you can see the lamina pretty clearly waving back and forth. And then as soon as you get to kind of where the purple areas infiltrate, you lose that back and forth wavy line. So this is just a pic this is not my patient. He did not have any of the classic giant cells. But this is kind of what it would look like if that were the case, right where those giant cells are, or, or where that is where that wavy um, lamina should be and has been disrupted. So as I said, a lot of these biopsies can demonstrate a skip lesion. And in this case, the, the normal that I showed you at the beginning is actually our patients. Um, so there was different cross sections, and if the cross section had been smaller and just shown this, we might not have had our diagnosis. So again, that's just showing the normal skip lesion. So recommend recommendations are, again, variable. Um, they suggest at least one centimeter. A lot of publications suggest over two and a half centimeters. Our biopsy was 2.9. Uh, should be unilateral. Studies show that by doing bilateral, your yield isn't that much more. And that the use of steroids should be less than 14 days um, starting before you get the biopsy. A lot of recommendations are that you get it while they're hospitalized. So the main kind of clinical question I wanted to ask and bring up during this grand rounds is should we continue to use temporal artery biopsy as our gold standard? So temporal artery biopsy isn't without any kind of cost. There's, there can be some pain associated with it. Facial nerve injury is the thing we kind of worry about the most. Um, wound complications, and then financial, it is considered a surgery. Um, we use this as a gold standard because its specificity is really high. If, you, if it's positive, it's positive. 
uh, near as 100%. However, the sensitivity is not so great. It's in some studies um, low as 60s and 70s and um, some higher ones in the 90s, but there's just a lot of variability. So this question as to whether or not we should use temporal artery biopsies um, was, was first questioned in 1981. There was a study that uh, reviewed 135 specimens and only about 60% of those with clinical temporal arteritis have positive biopsies. So um, in this old figure down in the bottom, you can see the clinical diagnosis. So this is based on clinical criteria, which in this case was if they had a headache, visual symptoms, or, and a hard, tender, or pulseless temporal artery, as well as plus or minus an ESR, which is interesting because it didn't really say if they included that in all cases or just some cases. Um, so you can see about 41% had clinical uh, GCA and histologically only about 25%. And these were all based on these criteria beforehand. They were not followed afterwards. So incongruent results, and that's just pointing out that studies came out right afterwards that showed a much higher sensitivity, 90 and 95 percent in these two studies that I have um, up here. And these again, so the, the hard thing I have looking through all of these studies based on whether or not we should use temporal artery biopsies is that they're based on, that the, the gold standard in this case is based on clinical diagnosis, and a lot of them have very different um, characteristics and criteria for what they include in those specifications. So in this 1982 publication, um, the three things they included were anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, an ESR of 91 or greater, and MOIS. And then in 83, um, this one that shows 95% sensitivity was based on pathological, radiologic, radiological, and clinical evidence. So basically anything that convinced them of GCA was included. Um, and these ones, rather than just looking at what was thought beforehand, it follows them over time, and if you know, over, over two years they still feel like they have GCA, that was what was considered um, positive clinical GCA. So um, some of these studies in the 90s were criticized because they were in areas with high Scandinavian descendants, um, which know, are known to have a higher rate of GCA. Um, and again, I s criticized because they use different criteria. After 1990, things get a little bit better because I talked about how that study came out and that it changed the five criteria for what is thought to be uh, specific for GCA. So the debate continues, um, but the question changed a little bit, which I think is actually more useful. So the question becomes, who cares how sensitive um, the artery biopsy is if the results don't change management. So um, starting in the 2000s, there's um, a lot of articles based on, okay, what if, you know, if the, you get the biopsy back, does that change whether or not they're on steroids? Um, and these three, one in 2003, one in 2005, and the most recent one, and actually the largest one in 2014, which had 237 patients, show a range in about this in the 70s. Um, of patients that do not change management. But still that leaves 30% that are, um, which I think is, is pretty significant, though a lot of these papers say only 30% are changing management and maybe that's not worth it. So another study related um, to this looking at, at, at changes after biopsy to management. This one only 16% of the results um, change management, but I thought this one was a little bit more useful because they actually provide a decision tree. Um, so they based on those the ACR criteria as to whether or not you should get a biopsy. So if you only have one of those criteria, they suggest that maybe you should consider a different diagnosis and not waste your efforts or the patient's um, time in getting a biopsy. Whereas if you have two or three of them, it might be worth getting it so you can kind of differentiate. And if you have four or more, it's probably, you probably also don't need a biopsy because you're so clinically sure. So in our, um, so again, here are those, those five classifications. So in our particular patient, he was over 50 and he had decreased pulsation. So that would be two of the criteria, which would suggest that we get a biopsy and which is positive and manages GCA. Um, so that fits nicely with our patient. 
Um, and a little bit more about him. So in follow-up, um, he's maintained excellent vision in his, his right eye, ranging from 2015 to 2020. Um, he continues to be no light perception in his left eye. Um, he's on a steroid taper currently over the next four months. He's um, following up with neuro-ophthalmology, I think, in another two or three weeks, and then has been seeing primary care to manage his steroid side effects. Um, <coughs> his ESR was 16 and has decreased down to two, and platelets decreased. They weren't really ever elevated, but they have come down. Um, and his CRP is also decreasing. Um, I put just a star by there because HSCRP is what we have at the VA, and it actually hasn't been studied at all um, in temporal arteritis, all it can really give us is whether there's inflammation or not, but it doesn't really have a lot of relevance, especially when we have ESR, which has been clinically studied. Um, so where we are now, um, despite 34 years of studies, there's not really any clear um, evidence as to whether or not we should use temporal artery biopsies. Um, there's no Cochrane reviews, and that's partly because, again, all of those clinical criteria for GCA are different for the different studies, um, and therefore there might not be enough to do a Cochrane review. But I wanted to put it out there and to see what you guys thought. Do you think you, we would have changed anything, and, and if this was your patient, not just sending it to neuro-ophthalmology, but if this was your patient um, and your biopsy had been negative, would have you changed anything with, based on our clinical findings? Um, and do you think that the fact that we found, had a positive biopsy made us um, continue on steroids when we otherwise might not have? Any thoughts on that, anyone? I know from, just from a medical perspective, that it really has a burden on, on the steroid to get it across a lot of sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the reasons why this is kind of a controversial topic because not only do you not want to miss the diagnosis um, because the consequences are high, but if you don't have the diagnosis, you don't really have GCA, you don't want to be on steroids for two years and poten these, are, these are older patients and you don't want to, um, yeah, like you said, potentiate um, the side effects from those. Yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting that the papers said that, on, you know, 70% of people didn't have change in management and that that, you know, shouldn't really justify getting one on everyone, but I think that's quite a large amount. Yeah. That's true. Thank you. 
Right. Thank you. Jack? Um, just coming back to uh, mention of medical legal um, aspects of education and training and how you're very concerned with that. It just seems to me that a bad outcome happening in schools is that it does a lot in our view of that to um, color and shape the impact of this on skills and medical education in general. Yeah, I, did, I mean, I didn't specifically search for that and didn't come across it when I was just, you know, doing some general searches, but that'd be really interesting to find out. Dr. Stagg? Yeah, I did. I didn't. I didn't like look into them a whole lot. Just, um, but there, there. That's that's a new thing that's coming up is is ultrasound diagnosis, and um, I think that might be something that might be added to those. You know, what I'd like to see is some sort of again a larger kind of diagnostic tree, and maybe having that be part of it, um, so that you know if we can make a positive or a negative. Uh, diagnosis based on that maybe prevent a few people from having to get the temporal bi biopsy. I'm not sure why there's no objection in the industry right now to that. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you guys diagnose everything in the country, but that's kind of silly. I haven't seen a lot of industry on temporal radiology being diagnosed or criticized for something. I'm sure some of the radiolo especially the radiologists are going to have some skills to point out that we're not we're not doing. I saw a few of those too. Yes. So there, there, uh, another study came out actually just in January of this year, but it was just, I, I didn't think it was that strong of information, so I didn't, I didn't put it up, but um, there have been some, a few studies done in African American populations and in Asian populations, and, and the, it, the, it, is, it is there, but it's just, it's a lot more rare. And there aren't, they aren't really necessarily done in country, they're done on descendants here in the States. So there's just not a lot of information available. Does that answer your question? I 
mean, I, I, I think, yes, I think most people would be less likely to, to follow that up, but I don't think it rules them out. I don't know offhand. Do you know Dr. Warner? I can't give you a number, but it's so he very had high. 40, 50 percent chance. So he was down one in LA, or was it two? Potentially. I don't know that either. So definitely, definitely referral to rheumatology, and then they could also, if any symptoms come up, they could potentially re refer them to us after that. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts, comments? I didn't find anything new. Um, just, you know, they've tried aspirin and a bunch of other things and basically non significant findings. I don't know if you know of anything else, Dr. Warner.
There's always something coming out. All right. Well, a special thank you to my friend Justin Caroon. He's a, a PGY2 PATH resident. He's the one that printed out those photos for me. Um, Dr. Warner for um, helping me with this case. My sister, she helped um, with those fundus photos. Those weren't actually the, my patients. Um, she helped create them with me um, based on other photos um, to represent what my patient had. And then Dr. Harry, who's, who initially saw this patient with me. Thank you.